Hi, my name is Dr. Philip Alexander and welcome to the World Revolution podcast. I'm here with a, a very good friend of mine, Stuart Wilson, who has been a professional golfer for the last 20 years and uh, is in the field of coaching and personal development. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Philip. Thank you. Good to see uh, you. <laughs> yes. Uh, I guess the reason why we connected, um, just it's been it's been a fair while now, um, mm. but it was it was in a group we connected, uh, which was to do with synchronicities, uh, n- numerology in the universe. Uh, yep. What 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 do you think um, brought about our connection? Um, at a root level, uh, a base level, I believe that spirit guides us through everything that we do. And when we're committed to that path, then the right friends, teachers, healers, helpers, whatever context people come into your life, everybody's there for a reason. Uh, whether we understand and comprehend that reason in that moment or whether it's a longer exploration with each other before we come to an understanding of why we connected we never know these things this is all part of life's great mystery and adventure Mm -hmm. Uh, on the surface level it was a mutual friend that recommended you in a in a mafia style way i vouch (laughs) for this man he's a good guy yes (laughs) yeah yeah um yeah it's i'm grateful grateful for the connection with you uh thank you yeah and it's been a been an absolute pleasure uh the few hours we've spent talking over the last few months probably i think it was maybe around october last year we mm-hmm. first had some sort of in-depth talk uh, and started to see the parallels in our lives and that we we've come from very different backgrounds and had very different experiences yet whenever i meet with someone i'm always wondering what the background story is how did we both end up in this same place at this same time i genuinely believe there is a meaning to to everything that's happening in life a causality and but there's always a There's always a seed of creation, and for me, for me, it was a commitment to follow my heart and my soul, and see where it takes me, and accept whatever the consequences were of those decisions. And it seemed to me that the effective way to stay on that path is to keep facing your fears. It's your fears that take you away from your path and away from your true self, away from your best self, higher self, however you like to refer to it. And, uh, and paradoxically, I discovered on that journey of knowing yourself, eventually that self doesn't really exist. <laughs> All that searching for self to find out that we are we are aspects of each other, and that that I I as an individual doesn't truly exist. Uh, if I'm in, A disconnection if I refer to myself as I. I used to live life like that. I, you, and my, it's we and us. It's we and us. And, and we're a focal point of a moment. And you're a reflection of my moment as I am a reflection of your moment. And there's something in searching for that meaning and the context of why and how we've come to connect. There's something that we need from each other. Whether we know what it is or not, (laughs) that's the beauty of the friendship. Um, But a short sentence that I read some time ago in the past, and I I wish I knew who, who said it, so I could give them the accreditation. 
I don't know who it was that said these words, but it was a, such a simple, beautiful statement. And it was in reference to connection with others. And it simply said, I don't want anything from you, but I do want everything for you. Wow. That's beautiful. It stunned me. It really stunned me. It stopped me in my track for a short time when I read that. And thought, that's, that's, that's what true love in action is. I know the reality is that somewhere on some level I do want something from you. Otherwise, I would be a hermit in a cave and sat in meditation for 30 years. And I did contemplate that along this journey of knowing myself. I, once I discovered things that I perceived to be a universal truth, then I had to change, then I had to take action, then I had to implement that into my life. And at one point in this development, because I've been on this path now for nine or ten years, nine years now, early in that journey when I started to look at Buddhism was my first port of call because I'd come from a place when I had no belief system whatsoever. I was completely nihilistic, atheist, and arrogant. But it was a false arrogance. It was an arrogance born of insecurity. It was a mask. It was a mask. And eventually, if you have your existence built on shaky foundations, it will fall apart. And that's what happened to me. And when I fell apart, I realized that there was no internal structure. I had no belief system that was in any alignment with the true nature of reality. And at that point, I didn't go searching for God. I didn't go searching for a religion. I went, I asked the universe and the creator to allow me to have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. I wasn't interested in knowingly holding on to any bullshit in my life anymore. And when I look back now, I can see so clearly all along that I always knew what was bullshit and what was real. But for whatever reasons, we avoid the truth because the truth forces change. Mm. And that's uncomfortable. It's truly, truly uncomfortable. And it's no different. I saw that parallel when I was teaching golf. Why is it if I give a player the right information, and I can see that they comprehend and understand what I've said, yet they still can't make the change. If they're physically capable of doing the movement, why does it then fall apart? Why doesn't it stick? And I came to understand, I went, I don't actually understand what human beings learn. I've learned how, I've learned about a golf swing. I've learned the mechanics of it. And every golf pro out there knows the mechanics of the golf swing. So there are no gol no bad golf pros as such when it comes purely to the to the act of playing golf. And most of them understand the teaching side of it. But there was one statistic that I came across very early in my career that the at that time average club golfers handicaps which is the the allotment of shots that a player is allowed according to their ability level that it hadn't improved in 40 years and that really shocked me because i looked at the nature of the game and i thought well the golf course has improved the machinery used on the course has improved so that the playing surfaces are better the golf ball has developed, it goes further. The golf club is easier to use. All of these external factors should lead to an outcome where there's a better performance. But the scorecard doesn't lie and the handicap system doesn't lie. It tells you exactly where you're at with the game and it hasn't improved. You could even make an argument that if all other external factors have made the game easier, but the score hasn't improved, that actually we've gone backwards. As a player, we've gone backwards. We're not taking advantage of all these amazing benefits available to us. 
And so it struck me that the problem lies in this relationship with the instructor and the pupil. It's not the pupil's problem because the pupil doesn't know how to do it. That's why they're coming to the advanced master, the professional, to get answers. The professional's giving them the answers. Yet the student can't absorb it and change isn't coming into effect. So there's a problem there somewhere. And it got to the point when I realized five years into my golf career, I didn't know how to teach. I don't know how to teach. I understand the golf swing. I understand how to play this game. But I'm taking money from people. I'm supposed to be here to help them. And it's not working. Right. And lesson by lesson and day by day, I started to loathe the act of going teaching, knowing that it wasn't working. With all my heart and my soul, I wanted to help people. But when it's not working and I'm taking money from people, and bless them, they don't know the difference between a good lesson and a bad lesson. They'll keep coming to you because they still want the answers. Right. And I'm unable to give. I can't do this anymore. Why, why golf? I mean, you, you spoke about a lot of uh, spiritual concepts or ideologies of life. Mm. Uh, why, why be a golfer and why teach people golf? As a, as a young man, um, I was socially active and I played a lot of sports, but I didn't really home in on one particular sport with any desire to, to become a world-class player and make a career and a living from it. I loved to play a bit of cricket in the park with my friends. I loved to go and play football. I loved, I got into a little bit of track and field. Um, which I did have a passion for track and field. I really loved high jump and I, I was a, a reasonable runner over 100 and 200 meters. Then I had a chasing experience where I had qualified for a, well, in the UK it's a, called a county, I guess it's a province in, the, in Australia. Mm. And I'd qualified from my school to go to a state championships and I go there and I got through my heats and I got to the final after 200 meters and I knew in that moment normally and normally when you run a 200 meters you don't quite run 100% flat out like you would a 100 for me I felt like I had to run at 95% to carry myself over that distance mm. I knew in that final and from those times I couldn't do that I had to give it 100% from the gun I did that I came out of the bend I looked around over my shoulders and I saw no one. And for a brief second, I sensed there might be some glory in the victory. And then these seven guys put on the afterburners and left me for dead. <laughs> and I finished last by 10 meters. And I went, there's nothing I can do about it. I cannot close that gap. I have finished 30 meters behind the guy that's won this. And, and so I understood then there was no, there was pleasure in running. There was no pleasure in coming last. That was how I perceived it as a young man. But I really loved, it was the first time I got engaged with the truly solo pursuit. All my other sporting activities had been social and team orientated. And then I'd been very close to my grandfather. And he was a golfer, a terrible golfer, really terrible, terrible golfer, but he loved the sport. And so I still didn't have a desire to be a golfer, but I did have a desire to be close with my granddad. So I started to caddy for him. I wanted to spend weekends with him. So I'd go to the golf course with him. I'd carry the bag around. At this point, I was probably about 14 years old. And eventually you get curious. Okay, come on then, give me that golf club, give me a ball, let me have a go. And I didn't fall in love with the game instantly. Not the complexities of the game, but I enjoyed the simple pleasure of hitting a ball with a stick around the field. As basic as that activity sounds, there was some mystifying pleasure in watching that ball fly off into the distance and knowing that you did it. And so 
I continued messing around a little bit and eventually I got to a point where I could actually reasonably consistently hit the golf ball and so I started to play the game I joined the golf club I gained a handicap but I was terrible absolutely terrible I my first handicap was 26 and there's a maximum of 28 uh, to give some context to non-golfers uh, you have a score known as the par for the course which is the Equivalent standard if you were a professional. So to play 18 holes on the course that I joined was a, made a total of 70. And that was your benchmark score. And for an amateur, you, you shoot three rounds and you take your average score. So if you shoot 99, 100, 101, your average score is 100, you'll get a handicap of 30. And that's your allotment to take off each round. So my first handicap was 26 and I couldn't play to it. And I went up. Each week, my handicap went up. I got worse and worse and more frustrated. And I was incredibly close to put down the golf clubs and never swing one again. I don't enjoy to be rubbish at an activity. <laughs> and so then the school holidays came along. And they put the opportunity to play every day. And I don't know what happened. To this day, I don't know what happened, but something mysterious clicked, some inner understanding of what was required. And suddenly I went from this kid that couldn't play to his handicap to shoot in 15 shots underneath it. Wow. Wow. I, I remember thinking, I can't make up 40 meters on a guy that's clearly quicker than me. I might be able to catch the guy that's five meters ahead of me. If I really work at it, if I get in the gym, if I do this, if I do that, I might be able to close five meters. I might be able to close 10 meters, but I simply don't have that raw speed to go out and compete with these guys. I just ran a personal best. In finishing stone cold last, I smashed my personal best by a quarter of a second. I went, wow. My personal best, the fastest I got, is 40 metres behind this guy that's winning. Wow. And then when I came to play golf and I suddenly realised, oh, when you suddenly understand something with golf, you can improve your performance exponentially. I don't know where my limit in golf is. I don't know how good I can become at this. And I'm not actually competing against anybody else. This sport's all about me. It doesn't matter what all the other people in this competition are doing. This game is about me. I don't need another. I don't even need another player. It's not tennis. I can't play tennis on my own. I can't play snooker on my own. But I can go out with a golf club and a ball in the jungle. I could go whack a ball down the street if I wanted to. My neighbours might get annoyed. <laughs> But there's something truly unique about this game of golf. And I didn't understand. I didn't analyze it at the time. I just carried on playing because I love to play. I really just love to play that sport. And then, then I was still results orientated at the time. But that, that massive initial surge of improvement and that pure love of the activity I knew in that moment I'd want to be a professional. That would have been in 1990, around about 1996. Right. Somewhere around there was the time that I absolutely knew I wanted to be a professional. I'd started to watch golf on TV. And so I started to identify my heroes in the game, my little inspirations. I want to play like this guy. I like that aspect of that guy. I just want to be the best me that I can be. But there was no evidence at that time to support my decision. There was nothing in my scores, in what I was doing to suggest that this is a future Tiger Woods. This is a future Jack Nicholas. This guy, this guy's got it. I never perceived myself to be particularly talented. But I had a work ethic. I had a work ethic and a desire and a dream. And so I applied myself. 
and I worked and I worked and I worked and I beat balls until my hands bled and I had calluses and I let the game drive me crazy. But somehow I found my way. Not through talent. Not through talent. I did it through sheer willpower. And I went, wow, what's possible with willpower and pure intent? I got told as a kid that you can do anything you want to do. Mm, I stopped believing in that when I got my ass whooped in a 200 meter race. No, I can't. I can't win a 200 meter race. <laughs> But I can be a golf professional. When it's truly from my influence and my influence alone, then I can create my reality. So it, it sounds like um, it, it requires a lot of mental perception or mm. mental development to be good at, uh, at this sport. Would that be correct? Yeah. And it was only years later when I had gone through my spell of playing and I was a competitive amateur at a reasonable level. And then I had an experience in two, the year 2000. I caddied for a guy called Neil Riley, who was one of the best professionals in the country. And he was on the fringes of making it onto the European tour and having some sort of world stage to go and play on. So he invited me to caddy for him at the qualifying school to try and gain access to the European tour. And I jumped at the chance. I went, fabulous. Yeah, I get to see inside the ropes what these master players are actually doing. I can't learn much. I can learn how not to do things from bad players, but I now need to know how to do things properly. Mm. So I want that access to the better players. So I go along in caddy and I analyze the situation and I I looked at it and went, the way the structure to get onto the European tour, you've got something approximately 150 players qualify to have their tour card for a season. During the course of that season, they need to finish in the top 120 money earners to be able to continue on the following season. If you are 121st and lower, you effectively go into a relegation and you have to go back to the qualifying school. Um, so there's one, two, three stages to qualify from if you're a nobody with no status and you're just making your way through. So you have to play a, a four-day, four-round qualifying competition in the UK, of which there were six venues running the same event concurrently and something like the top 25 players went through from each tournament. So you've got somewhere around 150 players qualifying from the first stage to go through to the second stage. Then at the second stage, you've got some of the guys that have been relegated from higher up start to join you. So the stand, the overall standard increases through the development stages until you get to the final stage where only 35 players will get their card for the following season. So I'm calculating the mathematics, the financial cost to attempt to even do this, to chase your dream and be a player. And I'm looking at this going to play those three tournaments. You're looking at somewhere in the region of 5,000 UK pound. Seven, eight thousand dollars. I mean, this is not a cheap adventure and there's no guarantee of success. There's no prize money in this. This is all expenditure. I went, OK, this is going to be very difficult. My family doesn't have the money to back me. I struggle to do this without sponsorship. If I have to go and work 40 hours a week, then that's what's required. But then that eats into your practicing time and you're trying to compete with the best players in the world that are playing full time. So I worked out the numbers and I went throughout Europe. There's probably somewhere in the region of 2000 players of my standard or better attempting to chase 35 qualifying positions. Your odds of success, that's not good. That's not good at all. And there's very, very few golfers that come along like a Tiger Woods or a Rory McIlroy that are so good at such a young age that you put a label on them and go, yes, 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 this one's going to get to the top. Without doubt, this one will get to the top. For the rest, it's 2,000 guys chasing 35 places. And I looked at that. And I went, any, th any little thought I had about being a world-class player, I let it go in that year. 
in that experience of caddying for that guy. I went, my future, I, I very much love this game, but my future is not as a player. And actually now when I step back from that dream, and I look around at the other golfers, whether they're professionals or whether they're amateurs, they're all out here seeking answers. They're all at, okay, you can help. To some degree, you can help the other golfers. I want to be a teacher. I want to be a teacher. I want to help these other players. I can see their suffering. I can see their frustration. I can see their anger. I can see so many things going on on a golf course. And then when I get to know, when it's players that you know, if it's the members at your golf club or you're playing on a regular circuit and you start to get to know the people off the golf course. So in my early 20s, I realized that the character that I see in a person off of the golf course seems to be directly mirrored and exposed on the golf course. Right. There's a parallel. There's in a what parallel. Way? In that, in life, in life we have free will. We can go any direction we choose. But if you make a commitment like I had to become a professional, then to some degree you sacrifice your free will. If I truly, honestly want to be a professional and I make that decision when I'm a 15 handicapper and I'm a long way from the top of the mountain that I'm trying to climb, I cannot afford to be dishonest with myself. If I tell myself falsehoods about my own game, I will not improve. It's impossible. I can hear it amongst the chatter. I can hear the members, the amateurs, say they want to be a better player, then go out and play terribly. And what's their reaction to that? Often they'll go and drown their sorrows in the bar. Is that actually going to help you with what you've stated, with the words that came out of your mouth? I want to play better golf. Is your reaction to playing bad golf taking you towards that? No, it's not. No, it's not. So there's, there's a... There's a divide between what we're saying and what we're doing. And then I'm looking across society and life in general going, I'm seeing that happen everywhere. Mm. It doesn't mean that a golf professional is necessarily a good person. They might be, um, many golf professionals are absolute arseholes, self-obsessed arseholes. Ask their former wives. <laughs> because the nature of the game is it solitary? The nature of the game of golf is solitary. But then how do they it get so good if they're like that? If they're self, self-obsessed self or they're self-absorbed or in a sense they're selfish, um, mm -hmm. how do they become so good at, at, their, at the sport? Because the one thing... They can, they can be as obnoxious and deceitful as they like away from the golf course. Even on the golf course, they can be obnoxious and deceitful to other players. But with themselves, they must be honest. I see. If they break that golden rule, then their performance will fall apart. I experienced it and I observed it. I would and also. To be honest, I found it. Uh, no, I was going to say, uh, e even if you do reach the pinnacles of any any um, anything that you follow, um, if you do it with uh, deceit or um, just selfishness or whatever it is, you're not going to be happy, even if you achieve it. Is, um, and this is what, what's the point what I found with, with most golfers, most golf pros. I genuinely believe everybody that plays golf, when they first picked up that golf club, they did it for fun. They did it with 
pure intent and an inquisitive nature something inside them something in the conversation because nobody's born a golfer but at some point there's a conversation going on in a human being's head that says yes i want to pick up that club i want to stand by that golf ball and i want to smash it far into the distance and in that moment in that thought and in that speech within your own head a golfer was born and some will walk away from it some will be curious try it and walk away from it but there's millions and millions and millions of people across the world that stayed with it something about that activity got them in that sense it's not that dissimilar to a drug addict some people some people will try heroin once and walk away from it other people will try that heroin and never break free from it yet they know sometimes what turn what started as a pleasurable experience i've never tried heroin in my life i've never even had a morphine patch but from talking to people that have had experiences like that it's heaven it's absolute bliss that euphoric high wherever it takes you in that moment is what keeps them coming back and golf has a similarly profound effect but on a much more subtle level but if you don't if you lose that love of the game if you lose the connection to the essence of the game and the spirit of the game it becomes a job it becomes a task it becomes a habit but it's not necessarily one that you actually enjoy and that's what I see with the vast majority, certainly in the amateur game, but even amongst the professionals, they fall out of love with it. But they're still doing it. They can't stop themselves. They can't stop themselves. And then I was, I was incredibly fortunate through synchronicity that uh, in my 30s, so at 25, I came the game. I walked away from the game. I knew I wasn't good enough to be a player, so why invest time and energy in practice and playing? Because there's no end product to it. I need. I've got bills to pay now. I'm 25 years old. I've got a mortgage. I've got a fiance. I've got plans to have a child in the future. I need to make a living, but I can't do this as a teacher, knowing that it's not working. It's breaking my heart and it's hurting my soul. I feel like a thief. I'm not giving the person what they've come here for, yet I'm still taking their money. I can't do this anymore. This is not an honest living. I need to stop this and I need to go and do something else. So I gave up the game. <coughs> I gave up the game and I went off into the building trade. Um, and then while I was in the building trade and I go off and do other things I didn't realise what I was doing but I put me in the hands of others I've been living life and living life in an existence that relied solely on my input when I made that switch and went into the building trade and started work as a subcontractor I didn't realize these things were happening this is only after the event analysis I put my future and my livelihood in power in the hands of other people I went off to do what I thought was an honest day's work I would go and build a wall I would go and knock a wall down I would install a kitchen I would fix the roof it seemed like an honest day's work for an honest day's pay and I was much more content with that than I was standing there. I was earning more money as a golf pro. I had an easier life. I was standing in a nice environment, smelling the grass, looking at the trees. Now I'm on dirty, dusty building sites. But I was happier. I was more content in my soul. And then the glass was struck. A redundancy came. My first redundancy came and i wrote that one out i got back into work relatively quickly but 
18 months later, two years later, second redundancy comes. This time I didn't get back into work quite so quickly. And it caused massive financial implications. It put a strain on my marriage. I had a young son then. And I thought, I haven't done anything wrong. I go out every day and apply myself, the same work ethic I had when I was a golf professional. And now I'm in the shit. Not just me personally, my family's in the shit. There's a danger we're gonna lose our house. How can this be? This is not right. This is not right. But you struggle on, you struggle on, you carry on. Eventually the marriage broke down, not just for financial reasons, there were other emotional issues and things going on. And so I was completely lost and broken. And at that point, for the first time in my life, reality smacked me and suicide became an option. I was so deeply, profoundly unhappy that I couldn't function. I couldn't leave the house. I couldn't go to my job. I couldn't. My world descended into a small, dark cave with inside my own mind. And then when I reached that point that I describe as the bottom of the emotional well, I knew that was it. You either have to let the well fill up and drown yourself and let this go, or you have to claim your responsibility and stand up. And I knew then, I knew then that everything that happened was my responsibility. I wasn't a victim. I wasn't a victim of redundancy. I wasn't a victim of grief. These things happen. These things are outside of your control. But I'd acquiesced my own personal power and put my life in the hands of other people. And so it took a little bit of time, but I started to ask the question, how do I come back to myself? Because I've never been so lost. And after I'd asked that question, this was my eureka moment. This was my eureka moment. I remember sitting in the office, tuning out of an argument with an architect not paying attention to him, lost in my own mind. And I went, that was it. The question in my mind was, when did I last want to get out of bed in the morning? When did I last want to connect with life? When did I last, where was I? And I went, I was a golf professional. Eureka, the light bulb, the light came back on. I was a golf professional. Okay. In that moment, I knew I needed to quit that job and I had to go back to golf. I didn't, didn't think or know if it was a long-term solution to where I was at, but I knew it was the first step. So take that step. And I knew I had to go and start at the bottom again. I knew I'd been out of the game. And I knew that I couldn't repeat and do it the way I'd done it before. Different Otherwise, mindset. History Completely different mind. The desire to help, the desire to teach had never left me. My love of the game, I realized then, had never left me. The cliched saying that you never forget your first love. For me, it's absolute truth. For me, that is an absolute truth. We never forget that first love. And, and so I took that step back into golf. I humbled myself. And I began again from the start. It didn't matter that I'd been a professional before. It didn't matter what I'd done in the game before. It mattered what I did now. There are a lot of uh, echoes in, um, in what you're saying to my own personal life. Mm. Yeah. I think if we really look, because whenever I've, this is something that I've done for a very long time, I wonder when we meet. Why are we here together? I mentioned it at the start. Why are we here together now? So in that sense, there should always be that echo in everyone we ever speak to. Why are we here now? Why am I looking at you? Why am I talking to you? What's the echo? If I can hear that echo, then I can start to, I can start to know that person. I can start to recognize who that person really is. Because we're all one. We are all one. 
we're all the same we all share a common dynamic experience of we call it life but it's a life cycle of life and death and suffering and and all those other common bonds that we share so yes, our individual experiences are different, our individual stories are different, but the, the archetypes that, that Jung described, the, the myths that Campbell, Joseph Campbell talks about in his storytelling, are absolutely true. The basic characters in any movie or any story, there's always a villain, there's always a hero, there's always a love interest, there's always a, a joker, there's always the funny man, the straight man, these, these, and we're all of those roles. Yeah. We are all of those roles to different people. So what I came to understand is it doesn't actually matter what I think of myself so much or how I see myself as a golfer or a human being or a husband or a this. It matters how the other person sees you. To one person, I'm an arsehole. To another person, I'm your best friend. To another person, I'm someone's son. I'm all of these things at all times. We're so multifaceted, but they're beneath that myriad of images. There's one commonality. And that one commonality is the vibration of pure love. And it took all of these life experiences and nine years of constant self-aware analysis to find these answers, to find these, to come to these conclusions and these viewpoints, to, to debunk the stories that we tell ourselves. Is what I'm telling myself just a myth or is it really true? Does it line up? Sorry, Stuart, I'm hearing a, a beeping sound. So. Sorry, I had another call from the Ah. Um, funny, it's 11.09, which is 9.11. That was my twin flame girlfriend, partner, spiritual wife calling in. <laughs> oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Oh, and it's 55% as well. Yeah. So we never escape the numbers, but that's the trivial side distraction. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many things that we could talk about. Um, yeah, we could go anywhere. Uh, <laughs> why do you think we're, we're actually here? If we're all the same, we're all one. Mm -hmm. Why are we, why do we appear different even though we're one? I mean, to even grasp, to comprehend what that is, what is your uh, perspective? Well, I started, yeah, I started to, to write a book and I'm in, still in manuscript stage at the moment. Um, and my motivation comes from the unnecessary suffering that we seem to cause each other and cause ourselves. There's a naive part of me, a childish part of me that I didn't really access until my son was born. And he got to the, the notorious stage of why at three years old, dad, why this, why that, why this, why that constant, why, 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 why? And I didn't assume that I knew the answer. I, before I ever gave him any answers, in my imagination or within my spirit, I tried to stand where he was standing and see the world that he was seeing. What's he looking at that's stimulating him to ask why? What does he see? I see the world through my own eyes, but I want to see the world through my child's eyes. I didn't know that actually I was accessing my own inner child. I can't see the world through another person's eyes. I can only ever actually see them through my own eyes, but I can change the filter that I look at through. 
much the same as wearing a pair of sunglasses. I can squint and look at the brightness or I can put sunglasses on and then my face changes. In that moment between wearing sunglasses and not wearing sunglasses, my face changes. My entire look would change. And yeah, I've gone, I've lost my tangent slightly there. Come, what was the original well, word? Back, well, if, if I may ask, because I'm not a parent myself, but do parents find themselves looking through the eyes of their children? I think they try to. And I, I think if we're not completely self-obsessed, and uncaring for what's going on in the bigger picture. I think most of us are well aware now that humanity is on a largely self-destructive course. Before I was a parent, I probably would have said something along the lines of, well, if humans wipe themselves out, they brought it upon themselves and they deserve it. Cause and effect. If you're that dumb to know that you're not living sustainably, that you've created a system of existence where we have an <sighs> money makes the world go round apparently, and we have an economic system that relies on permanent eternal growth, yet we exist on a planet with finite resources. My logic was always been, well, that doesn't work. If human population keeps increasing and we keep consuming, this has to go bang eventually. It's not going to end well for humanity as a collective. But isn't then isn't when the a, sorry? Then when once I look at it as a father, and I go, this isn't just about me. Life is no longer about just me. This is about what do we leave for tomorrow? This is no different to going out, trekking and arriving at a campsite. Campsite rules dictate that you should leave that site better than you found it. Mm. And then there's something there for tomorrow's adventurer, tomorrow's child. But we don't live that way as a collective experience of humanity at the moment. Wow. And at that point, at that point, it actually terrified me. I thought, what world have I brought my child into? Where are we going? What are we creating together for our children? Isn't the divine creating all of that anyway, though? Possibly. I don't know the answer to that. The reason why I asked that question um where the parents see through the eyes of their children. So I felt like as you were um, speaking on this, there was a reflection of us being the children of the divine and the divine seeing itself through the eyes of us being its children. You make a really, really salient point there. Eventually, because I'd come and lived for so long and trained my brain to think in such a nihilistic way. I couldn't allow myself to break that train of thought. I found it incredibly difficult to let go, even though through this journey from that point of facing suicide and then having my son in my life and changing my viewpoints, changing the way I look at things, I started to have experiences that deep inside I knew, I knew that there is a God and that unconditional love was the right way to be. Yet my logical mind or cognitive dissonance, if you want to call it that, couldn't accept that reality. I wouldn't allow it in. I wouldn't allow it in and I now understand that that came from fear because the moment I allow that truth into my life and I accept God and I accept that I am a child of God I'm not a golf professional I'm I'm not even an adult I'm not really in the biggest scheme of all creation 
I'm not even really a man at the moment. I'm a child. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of creation. I was deeply uncomfortable accepting that because I knew the implication. Once you accept that, everything has to change. How do you mean? I could no longer. It was almost like I knew the truth. I knew that as the truth of existence, but I chose to hide from it. I used free will to keep up my naughty little ways, to not be my best self. I would allow myself to continue smoking. So 10 years ago, I make a commitment, I want to be my best self. I know all the way through that journey. Smoking tobacco is not an act of loving yourself. It cannot be. We know it's destructive to the human body. You're trying to, you say, I say to myself, I say to other people, I am going to be my best self. I want to bring my mind, body and soul into alignment. Yet I continue to take an action that I know is contrary to that statement. And maybe it's, for me, I'm not a drinker, but maybe we go out drinking every time. Every time you go out and you get drunk on a Friday night and you wake up with that hangover Saturday morning and we say, we're not going to drink again. I won't do that to myself again. And maybe you go one or two weeks dry and then you do it again. You devalue yourself. You devalue your own word to yourself. You don't owe that answer to any other human being, but you owe it to yourself. It becomes like an almost like an honest lie, a deceit of self, the forked tongue. We say one thing and do another. And I knew that once I accepted God, if I came out openly and said, I've changed, I haven't changed, I've revealed what I know to be the truth. I know that I am a child of God which means now that I have to accept that I'm being watched effectively all the time. I'm now accountable. By making that statement, I'm now accountable, not just to myself, but to God himself. In the awareness of that? In the awareness of that. I knew once I utter those words, once I start to speak that way, once I start to, for want of a better phrase, preach, then there are huge implications. Now, there's nowhere, to hide. there's nowhere to hide. We think we can tell these little white lies. We think we can sneak around and not honour our word. Can you really do that if there is a God? No. Watching the door? Or when the time comes and we come to pass and we get called home to him, that father figure, there's your judgment, Dan. But okay, so live my life. But that, that father yeah. figure is unconditional love, though, which means that it doesn't distinguish anything as right or wrong, good or bad. Okay, put it this way. <laughs> You're 12 years old. You've done something naughty and your actual blood father has grounded you. And you don't like that one bit. You hate it, but he's taken a course of action that he knows is right for your well-being. But it goes against your free will. If you then go and defy his order and sneak out the window, disappear off down to the park, <laughs> and something happens, something out of your control happens, you're just messing around with your mates and... Oh, you roll over and you break an ankle. You're just kicking a football around. You think you're being clever. You think your dad's not going to find out. Yeah, yeah, I'll get back before he's home from work. No one's ever going to catch me. I'm fine. You know you defied your father's orders. Something happens that's out of your control. You roll over. You've broken your ankle. Now you're off to hospital. Now you're not getting home before your father. Now you're going to get busted. Your father's going to kick your ass when he gets hold of you. Does that mean 
that he does love you unconditionally or not. He there are you. rules to the game. Yeah, yeah. There are rules to the game. And when you understand the rules and you play within the rules, everybody gets on fine. We, might, we don't have to agree and like the rules, but we have to accept that the rules are there. Otherwise, it's a free-for-all, a complete free-for-all. We can make it as simple as playing Monopoly. If we've got five, five friends sat around a table playing Monopoly and one decides to cheat, and the other four know they're cheating. Is that fun for the group? Mm. Or is the action of one person detrimental to the enjoyment of the game for the group? When it comes back to golf, it doesn't matter. Golf is the hardest sport in the world, of that I'm convinced. And it's brutal. The rules are brutal. But they are what they are, and they're the same for everybody. But if I go out and play golf and I see someone cheating, he's not answerable to me. Ultimately, he's answerable to himself and he's answerable to whoever's organized the competition. Do I, does that mean I have to hate the guy? No, I don't have to hate the person. I can absolutely love that person and want the best for them but I can despise their actions. Why are you cheating, dude? So it comes down to the intention. Yeah. So we have the free will to have whatever intention we like, but if we've truly committed to be our highest self, our best self, then we can't cheat, but we have to regulate ourselves internally in our heart we know what's right and what's wrong you don't need a manual a written rule book to tell you the rules of the game you know when you look inside we know when we drop our biases when we drop our biases for the outcome buddha buddha taught that our suffering our needless suffering our unnecessary suffering comes from our attachments well our attachments are our expectations and our own personal biases when you let go of those expectations when you let go of those biases to fix a certain outcome in your favor What's the difference between doing that and cheating in playing Monopoly? If you're trying to fix the outcome of a game of Monopoly, <laughs> you're not playing the game fair. You're not playing the game right, so far as I understand it. But it's not for me to judge a fellow brother or sister. I have no right to do that. I'm not God. I'm a child in the image of God. I'm not God. It's not my place to judge that person. But one day you will face that judgment. One day your father will come home. You'll find you're not in your bedroom when you've been told the rules of the game. You're grounded, son. So... The best advice I can give, whether you're a golfer or an artist or a chef or a builder or a doctor, is make a best attempt to actually understand the rules of the game and play within them. And those rules are in your heart. They're not in the mind. They're not in philosophy. We get some clues. We get some indicators. It's all great information. It all helps us to stimulate us to think. But maybe the best piece of technical advice, if to call it that for want of a better way to explain, it is understanding that everything is energy in a constant state of movement. And love is the highest and the purest vibration to move that energy. It's the source of all creation. 
if we if we knowingly cheat ourselves then we are not in vibrational alignment with that love we bring that fear upon ourselves because deep down i believe we know that one day we're going to face that judgment one day we're going to face that father and we will be held accountable for our actions we will be asked to explain ourselves Stuart, um, I have to end this podcast here, but um, I think this is a really good note to, to end it on. It was like, yes, there's lots to think about, but <laughs> for you and hopefully anybody that listens. And uh, people can f uh, follow you on, on Facebook, can't they? You can put me on Facebook. I'm going to, when we finish this call, I'll go and post my Twitter feed on there. And I have periods of complete inactivity and then I have bursts of manic insight and thought and information sharing. And, um, He's so also yeah. writing a book, which uh, which uh, be heavily anticipating. Yeah, hopefully I, uh, the book really is a platform to give me more detailed parts of my journey we've skipped over kind of topics but this this book really gives the nuts and bolts of the individual experiences along the way hopefully I, I i set out to write i didn't never set out to be a writer but i had enough friends encourage me around saying look you've you've got something that we enjoy hearing yeah and, uh, maybe we could talk about writing so i took that on board eventually and started that process and really it came from that same desire as it was to teach golf. I just want to help people. I just, if that book helps one person, then it's worth my time and effort. Much the same as, as your book, I guess. When, whenever we create something and the seed of that creation comes from pure love, then only good things come. Yes. But that's, that definitely sounds like the, the right note to finish on. Thank you, Stuart, and uh, we'll have to continue Sorry. this again. <laughs> Thank you for the, for the opportunity to open up and be transparent and have a platform to, to share with you and others. Love you, brother. Love you too, brother. Namaskar. I'll see you soon. <laughs>